Hello, everyone. Welcome back to our Redeemer Lutheran Church Bible study on the book of 1 Corinthians. I'm Pastor Eric Kleinschmidt from Redeemer Lutheran Church in Highland, Indiana. And today we're discussing 1 Corinthians chapter 14. I will put the link for last week's study, chapter 13, which talks a lot about the nature of love, um, God's love for us, and not necessarily our love for each other, although our love is patterned after the way that God loves. But I will put the link to that study right up here. Hopefully these work. I went back to look at some videos from some time ago, and um, for some reason all those things are gone. So I don't know if uh, after a while they they phase out or they're not linked anymore, if there's an update or something like that. But if you're going back to some of our old playlists, please understand that. Um, the reason I was looking at those, not because I like to watch myself do this, that's really kind of torture, but um, there's apparently a radio station out, uh, out west somewhere that is asking, it's out in Nebraska, Lincoln, Nebraska, uh, to broadcast parts of our a Roman study, along with their own Bible studies over their, their radio station, a mission run by a congregation out there. So if you happen to be listening out there in Lincoln, Nebraska, hello and, and thank you. Um, also, there's a congregation in Tennessee that is using uh, our psalm study for their own uh, Bible study uh, group there. So they asked for it on DVD, which was a new experience. So, hey, if you're involved in this, we really thank you for watching. Um, and uh, it seems to be growing in different ways that I never anticipated. And um, yeah, not sure how I feel about having all this stuff out there because this is not edited. Uh, I don't get a chance to go back through. And if I say something stupid or uh, mispronounce something, I can't go back and fix it. So it's out there for everybody to see, but so, so be it. Thank you for watching. Thank you for studying along with us. Let's get to chapter 14 today. Paul is continuing to discuss this issue of speaking in tongues in the Corinthian church. Um, and if you remember, we, we talked about whether or not this was patterned after what happened in the book of Acts on Pentecost, where the disciples spoke in, um, well, actually they preached the, the gospel and it was heard in many different languages. So, so whether or not the disciples were actually speaking in other languages is a question that we don't really have an answer to. What we are told is that the people all heard an understandable language, their own um, so it is possible that the disciples were simply speaking in Hebrew um, or in Greek or in Aramaic, but everybody heard it in their own language, and that was the, mir the, the miraculous thing that happened there uh, without the need for an interpreter. And that'll be an important uh, note that the, the act's experience of speaking in tongues did not require someone to interpret what the disciples were saying. However, here in 1 Corinthians 14, we are going to see the necessity of an interpreter for those who are speaking in tongues in Corinth. Okay, so that gives us a hint that the two things were not quite the same, that there was a different thing that changed. It is unclear here in Corinth if they are speaking in languages that they have not studied, or if because of the metropolitan character of Corinth, because of its importance as a trade city, um, whether they just had a lot of people from a lot of different places, and they would come and they would talk about how they came to know Jesus Christ or, or about the thing that they learned from an apostle somewhere, and they would speak in their own language, and there wouldn't be a whole bunch of people there that were speaking that language, and yet they, they wanted to um, have this person um, proclaim what they what they had learned and what they knew and be a part of the congregation. The ability to speak in tongues that were intelligible to other people um, seems to be lacking. Instead, there appears to be a lot of speaking in tongues that went untranslated in Corinth, so much so that the people were actually starting to compete with one another and would talk over one another. And it kind of just devolved into um, your worship service becoming a whole bunch of people just speaking gibberish around you. At least that's what it would, it would sound like to you, even if they were uh, by chance actually speaking some revelatory information from the Holy Spirit. It wasn't benefiting anyone, and it was starting to become this cacophony of languages, and um, Corinth became like known for it. Well, this ecstatic sort of expression of 
divine truth wasn't unique to Christianity in the Roman world. Uh, the worship of the pagan gods sometimes included incoherent, ecstatic, drug-fueled uh, speech. The, the oracle at Delphi, uh, or Delphi, I'm not sure exactly how that is pronounced, um, there's, there's evidence that the cave that the, the, the oracle was in um, had a lot of methane in it or something, and so that the oracle was was high all the time. And so they would go and ask this this person who was drugged out of their mind to predict the future, and what they got wasn't always intelligible. So um, these sorts of things where people would utter just nonsense were pretty popular in the Roman world. And at Corinth, it was God obviously wants things happening to be different. And we're going to see that God sets apart his worship differently than the pagan worship around him. Um, God didn't want uh, his people to be doing what the pagan religions were doing, but the people in Corinth were like, well, hey, this is what this is what religion is. This is what church is, as these people speaking in these languages, and we have more than, than anybody else. And some of it was actually fueled by the Holy Spirit. So they took a good thing and they made it bad and they emphasized it too much. And so Paul is writing to kind of curb this back, to put some rules on it, and to clarify things here in 1 Corinthians. So let's look at the text and, and see how Paul does that. First, he says he wants them to pursue love. Now, if you remember from chapter 13, this love is a type of love that God has for us. It's not really talking about our love for each other, because love is patient, love is kind, it does not keep a record of wrongs, it endures all things, hopes all things. That does not describe our ability or our experience with loving other people, because we are sinners and imperfect beings. 13 really talks about God's love for us, shown to us in Jesus Christ, who sacrifices himself for our well-being. Our love for each other, of course, is patterned after that, even though we will never reach that type of perfect love. Okay, so we need to keep those things clear. So when, when Paul says pursue love, he's actually saying it in two ways. He wants you to pursue and hold fast to the love of God for you in Christ Jesus. That's first and foremost. Then, because of that faith and because of you've received that love, that will express itself in love for your neighbor. That is the nature of the flow of love. It comes from God to us and then us to our neighbor. Our cup overflows so that we can fill our neighbors. All of that. Okay, we love others because he first loved us. We forgive as we have been forgiven, but God is the first giver of all these things, okay? Paul here is saying that you must first pursue and most, most importantly have the love of God for you in Christ Jesus, and then seek to show that love to each other through patience, through kindness, through building up. That word building up is going to become the most important word throughout this chapter of uh, 1 Corinthians 14, because it is the theme for and the, um, the litmus test for all good things that are happening in the congregation. Is it building up or not? That word's going to appear seven times in this chapter alone, and of course that number seven is the, the number for godly perfection, okay? So that building up is something that God desires, and the question is, is what you're doing building up others? Love drives that building up. It has an eye towards your weaker brother. It does not cast them aside, does not engage them in useless controversies. Um, all of these sorts of things that we've been talking about leading up to this are driven by our love for each other, which of course is made possible by God's love for us. All right? So God's love comes to us. That love then goes out to others. When Paul says pursue love, he means that whole process. All right? Okay. So he says, first pursue love, then earnestly desire spiritual gifts, including the gift of speaking in tongues. But you remember that there was another gift that he spoke highly of, and that was the gift of prophecy, okay? But he says here, he does not say speaking in tongues. He says, especially that you may prophesy. Okay, now, if you remember, prophecy is used in two different ways in the New Testament. First, when we think of prophecy, we often think of someone telling about a future event that hasn't happened yet, 
okay? Uh, Nostradamus is one of the, the famous supposed prophets, right? He told, foretold these events. And the, um, I would say even now people are, the Simpsons cartoon uh, is prophetic for some people because they say, oh, the Simpsons, you know, predicted the, the presidential election eight years ago or something like that. Um, I'm not sure about that. But anyway, uh, sometimes life imitates art. Um, but the idea of saying that um, on January 20th, 2027, there will be five meteors that land in Highland, Indiana. Okay. If I make that prediction and then it comes true, you might say that was a prophetic tr tr prediction. You might even call me a prophet. But that's what we think of most about the telling of the future events. God certainly does that through um, his, his people, uh, the prophet Jeremiah and Isaiah. Um, we just are studying Isaiah in Bible study here on Sunday, and we had the, the chapter uh, uh, 4, 40, 45, around there, where, where God is talking about Cyrus, that his servant Cyrus will come and send his people back home. Cyrus hadn't been born yet. Um, we're, we're like a hundred years or more out from Cyrus even being king of Persia when Isaiah lists this prophecy, okay? So um, that's the one type of the use of the word prophecy, and it is present in the church, although it lessens as the church age goes on. So by the time of the apostles, you didn't have as many prophecies because the major one was fulfilled. That was the coming of Jesus. And then you have the writing of Revelation, probably about 90 AD by John, who's the last surviving disciple, as far as we are aware. He's writing in, in exile on the island of Patmos, and he gives us this revelation that takes us all the way to the end of time and beyond. Because of that, most Christians understand that God doesn't have a use for the type of prophecy that we're discussing, this foretelling of future events, because he's already told us what's going to happen from Genesis to Revelation, so there's no need of it. And as we saw last week, the Bible actually says that prophecies will cease, speaking in tongues will cease. So I um, and my denomination and other denominations, majority of Christians, understand that the gift of prophecy in the church and telling of future events has come to end with the apostolic age, okay? It doesn't mean that all Christians believe that, all right? And I'm willing to be proven wrong, I guess, but um, haven't yet. So, and I would say a mark of uh, being wary of a cult or, or some weirdo Christian outfit is, are they making predictions about the future? Uh, because that doesn't really ever go well. David Koresh, Jim Jones, uh, Marshall Applewhite with the Heaven's Gate cult and the Hale Bop Comet, if you remember all that. Because um, remember, Jesus said no one knows the day nor the hour. So if somebody is saying, oh yeah, Jesus is going to come back at this time, that's a red flag right there. All right. That's the first type of the use of the word prophecy. The second time in a type, instead of being foretelling the future, we talk about forth telling or telling forth the word of God. All right. This is something that God's prophets, priests, and kings did throughout the Old Testament and the disciples do in the New. They are simply repeating to people what God has said to them. They are spokespeople. They are mouthpieces for what God has to say. Some of that includes what will happen in the future. So when I, as a pastor, tell you that God's word says that Jesus will come again to judge both the living and the dead, I am foretelling a future, but it's not because I've received some special revelation. No, I'm simply telling you what God has told us in the scripture. So you could say that in that way, I am doing both types of prophecy. I am foretelling the future, although God is the one who, who, who revealed it, and I'm also speaking forth the word of God. Today, the prophecy that we're talking about is primarily the second type of simply repeating or proclaiming what God has said to us. And I think that is what Paul is emphasizing here. He wants everybody in the congregation to be centered on the Word of God and to have that be what they talk about when they come together for worship. Okay? Okay. So when Paul says, I earnestly want you to desire the spiritual gifts, especially 
the gift of prophecy, the fourth telling of the word of God. I would, all of you were centered on the word of God, is what Paul is saying. Now he's going to address the speaking in tongues. For one who speaks in a tongue speaks not to men, but to God, and no one understands him. So this is the problem in Corinth, that languages were being spoken and nobody understood them. It's not what happened at Acts, where everybody understood what was being said. Here we have a disconnect between what was being said and what was being understood. It's very much possible that the person who was speaking was inspired by the Holy Spirit and was saying good things, but only God could understand them, is what Paul is saying. It didn't build up the church. He might be uttering mysteries of the Spirit, good, beautiful, true things, but nobody was benefiting from them because they couldn't understand it. On the other hand, the one who prophesies, okay, now remember, this is the one who speaks the word of God, speaks to people for their upbuilding. This is the first instance that we have of this word for edification, all right? It is a Greek word, and the root of that word is going to be used seven times in this chapter alone, and it is the, the important uh, theme and the litmus test for everything in this chapter is, does it build up the church, okay? For their upbuilding and encouragement and consolation, God's word does that. It builds people up, it encourages them, and it brings them comfort. That is, this is not the, the foretelling of a future event doing all this. This is the comfort of God's word as revealed in the scriptures. So again, we see this difference in the usage of the word prophecy or prophesy, all right, there's the foretelling of future events, and there's the foretelling of what God has said. We are focused primarily in this chapter and in much of the New Testament on that second definition, the foretelling of what God has said. Paul continues, the one who speaks in a tongue builds up himself. He's revealing one of the issues of Corinth, that they were boasting in their ability to speak in tongues. And you can might imagine that some people might have been faking it, because if they can't understand you when you're speaking, well, then you, oh, I just received a new tongue, and you babble on in a different way. Oh, wasn't that great? Oh, guess what? I got another one, and you babble on in a different way, right? So um, that is, and I use the word you babble on because um, you Tower of Babel or Babel, right? Um, where people all had the same language, and then they started to, to abuse that to become God is sort of, sort of what they thought, so God confused their language. So the difference in tongues actually shows the, the sin of mankind. The fact that we have different languages is evidence of God addressing our sinfulness. And so at Pentecost, when the disciples speak one language, but it's heard as many, you actually see a reversal of the Tower of Babel. God unites his people around the message of Christ crucified for sinners. So um, the, the Pentecost event in Acts is actually a reversal of the Babel or the Tower of Babel event in the Old Testament. Just a little bit of an aside. Paul here says, the one who speaks in a tongue builds himself up, so he edifies himself, but the one who prophesies, that is, proclaims God's word, builds up the church. Now, I want you all to speak in tongues. Why? Well, because it is a gift of the Spirit, okay? It was evidence that the Spirit was active in this apostolic age, and it also, uh, if it was patterned after the apostolic uh, uh, Pentecost event, it would have the benefit of reaching people who do not yet know Christ. So Paul is saying, listen, I'm, I'm not saying that this is a bad gift. It is one of the gifts. I'm saying that you Corinthians have an unhealthy focus on it, and you're abusing it. Um, so he says, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, the gift of tongues, that's great and all that. But really, look what he says here. But even more, I want you to prophesy. I want you to speak the word of God. He's not saying, I want you to predict future events. I want you to focus on what God has told you. The one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues. He comes right out and says it. The Corinthians were so focused on speaking in tongues that their worship had gotten away from just talking about what God said in the Bible, what the disciples writ, wrote down in their, uh, their uh, Gospels, and uh, the teaching that God had for them, and was instead focused solely on these people just making noise around them. He says, the one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues unless someone interprets. If you cannot understand what they're saying, it doesn't benefit. 
the church may be built up. Again, that is his litmus test for whether or not the speaking in tongues is beneficial and good. Does it build up the church? And we have another occurrence of that, that root for edification. He's going to continue on. Verse 6. Now, brothers, if I come to you speaking in tongues, here's the first hint that we are given that Paul has this spiritual gift. He says, how will I benefit you unless I bring you some revelation or knowledge or prophecy that could be a foretelling of future events, but it could also just mean the teaching of God. And we, it's probably more the second. Uh, we might even understand it, prophecy being preaching, because look at the next word, or teaching. He's saying, so if I come to you and I utter something in a language you don't understand, what benefit is to you? But if I had someone to interpret, or if I was able to repeat the event that happened in the book of Acts, where I could speak in one language and you could hear me in your home language, what benefit is it unless I am bringing you something from God? Okay? Um, he says, verse 7, if even lifeless instruments, such as the flute or harp, like, wait, wait a minute, how did we get to instruments? Paul is using a metaphor. He's trying to give an example that they might be familiar with. The Greeks and the Romans loved their music, okay? And so now he's going to talk about, um, like, uh, imagine that you're going to one of those fancy plays that, that has the orchestra down in the, the pit uh, that, are, that are scoring the scene and the activity on the stage behind them, right? Well, as you, you get your tickets and you make your way to your seat and maybe you get your little opera glasses out and the, the people down there that are playing their instruments are already in their seats. They got their instruments out. And before they start, what do you hear? You hear them playing random notes. The strings are starting up and the, the horns are honking and, and you might hear a drum off to the side. It's not coordinated, nothing. They're just trying to, you know, make sure that the instrument is functioning. That's the type of noise that Paul is referring to here, okay? If even lifeless instruments, such as a flute or harp, do not give distinct notes, how will anyone know what is played? Oh, and if the bugle gives indistinct sound, who will get ready for battle? Even in ancient times, the bugle was used to muster forces, to tell them to advance, to tell them to retreat, very much in the same way that we think of as happening in uh, the Civil War, okay, um, and those sorts of things, that the, the instrument was used to give people direction. But if you couldn't hear it, or it, you were like, well, was that two blasts or was that three? I'm not sure. Well, two blasts mean we go forward, and three blasts mean we go back. What do we do? That's not good on a battlefield, okay? So Paul is saying that the order of worship must be clear. And Corinth, this, this cacophony of noise of people speaking in tongues that nobody else understood was not leading to orderly worship, and it was not building up, and therefore it was not good. So you with yourselves, verse 9, if you, with your tongue, you utter speech that is not intelligible, how will anyone know what is said? For you will be speaking into the air. It's useless. There are doubtless many different languages in the world, and none is without meaning. Here we're given a hint that it's not just, um, you know, this, this, this non-existent human language that somebody is speaking. Like it's given to them from above the Holy Spirit. Nobody understands the words. You can find examples of this on YouTube, you know, just... I, don't, I hesitate to tell you to go and look it up and say, you know, type in, you know, praying in the spirit, you know, or praying in tongues, because what you're going to get is somebody that's rocking themselves into an ecstatic state and then just, you know, oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You know, that's what they're going to do. Okay, this, this sort of ecstatic speech. Um, th that might be some part, or a lot of what was going on in Corinth, but we're also given a hint that, that Paul is saying that, hey, no, you're bringing in languages from other parts of the world, because speaking in tongues was used for both types of speech. 
if somebody if you know came here and is speaking in german or spanish or something that'd be they were speaking in a different tongue than than english okay it's not that the language doesn't exist it does it's just not known to many people here and corinth being this trade place obviously had people from all over the world and so apparently they would be invited and they would come to church and they would listen about these people talking about jesus and the, i know jesus and oh well they just get up and talk about how they came to know jesus and how jesus has been great to them so i'm going to stand up and in in my own language because it's difficult to translate into the greek that they're using or whatever language i'm going to say the same thing and people go oh that's amazing oh yes preach it you know um that's kind of what we get this sense of. So um, it was probably both happening here, ecstatic speech and also languages that weren't spoken by the majority of the people at Corinth were both being uttered. But we get that from the text here. He says, if I do not know the meaning of the language, if I don't speak Spanish, I will be a foreigner to the speaker and the speaker a foreigner to me. We won't be able to, to connect. So with yourselves, since you are eager for manifestations of the Spirit, strive to excel in building up the church. That is what he's saying. Like this, this, what you're focused on is not building each other up. Instead, each one of you is seeking to be known as the person who speaks in the most tongues, or, or they really, they really, you know, under, must have the Spirit because they're really um, excited about what they're saying. They're rolling on the ground and, and foaming at the mouth as they proclaim the, the wonders of God in language that nobody can understand. Paul is saying that's, that's building up yourself. It's a selfish thing. And instead, you're supposed to be concerned about building one another up because we are the body of Christ. And that being the body of Christ is going to play um, later when we talk about order in the church. So keep that in mind, but we're not there yet. What are we going to do with all this? Verse 13, Paul says, Therefore, one who speaks in a tongue should pray that he may interpret, whether he be given an interpreter or that he be able to translate what he just said. Because, verse 14, For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. It doesn't benefit me learning anything more about the faith because I can't understand what's being said. What am I to do? I will pray with my spirit, but I will pray with my mind also. God gave us a mind and a brain, and we're supposed to use it, okay? This comes into play um, when, well, let me, let me finish this out, and I'll, then I'll tell you about what it's like to be a vicar supervisor. 16. Otherwise, if you give thanks with your spirit, how can anyone in the position of an outsider say amen to your thanksgiving if he does not know what you are saying? Even if you come and you say, I just want to thank God for preserving my family and preserving my business during a, a natural disaster, and he's helped me uh, with renewed health, and I'm, I'm just so thankful that Jesus loves me. But you're saying that in a language, Spanish, German, whatever, that's not intellig intelligible to the people around you. How can anyone go like, yes, good for you, we're happy for you? It doesn't build anyone up. It doesn't connect in with anyone, and therefore it's, it's not beneficial. That's what Paul is saying. No one in the position of an outsider can say amen, like, yes, I, I, you are right, to your thanksgiving when he's not knowing what he's saying. For you may be giving thanks well enough, but the other person is not being built up. And then we have this moment where Paul puts down the hammer. You know, he, he drops the hammer here. I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. Paul has a tendency to boast, right? He says, I boast in my weaknesses and I boast in the Lord, but there's a lot of places where Paul just boasts, and this is one of them. Paul apparently did speak in many languages, whether that's languages he studied or whether that's gifts from the Spirit like Pentecost or whether that's ecstatics, I'm not sure. But he makes this boast, and I'm betting that he makes it fully knowing that you could fact check him. He knows that. Go and ask the churches, right? So here we revealed this. That Paul is saying, you love these gifts, and guess what? I have them. And I'm telling you, they're not beneficial. There is a credibility that Paul has right here. It reminds me of that moment um, where the, the, 
they say, oh, he doesn't know what he's doing, and oh, he just doesn't like the fact that we can speak in tongues and he can't. You can imagine the, the Corinthians saying all these things as they read Paul's words, and there comes this moment that reminds me of the prince's bride um, when they're fighting and, and they're, they're talking about their swordsmanship, and, uh, and Nico Montoya goes, oh, you think that, that you're, you're keeping up with me, but guess what? I've been fighting left-handed this whole time, and I'm not left-handed. And then he starts to really fight, and he wins, and then, of course, uh, uh, our, our hero, uh, Dread Pirate Roberts in disguise here, comes along saying, well, I'm also not left-handed, and they move forward from there, okay? Um, but it's that moment where you thought that you were sparring with somebody, and now he's going to reveal that no, um, you're out of your depth here. And that's what Paul is saying, because not only am I an apostle of the Lord Jesus, he'll drop that hammer a little bit later, but right here he's saying, like, I have this gift and I'm telling you not to use it this way, okay? Um, and he says this, nevertheless, in church, I would rather speak five words with my mind in order to instruct others. I'd rather speak five intelligible words that people understand than 10,000 words in a tongue that people can't. Every once in a while, I have to bring out this passage and present it to our pastors in training. Vickers, uh, I get a new one every year. I'm on like number 15, 16, somewhere, somewhere in there. I forget. They all kind of blend together after a number of years. Um, but they're a student studying to be a pastor. They spend a year with us here learning, putting things into practice that they learned at the school, right? And they go back for their fourth year of graduate school at the seminary. And if they pass all their courses and everything else, then they'll be called out to be pastors on their own. But sometimes when they come out of seminary and they try to preach to a congregation, they are preaching way up here. They're using vocabulary and they're making connections and they're taking too long um, because they are graduate school students. They, they are on a high level of theology, okay? The people that Christ cares about, however, out there in the pews, aren't there. And so what the vicar might say just goes right over the head because he's using terminology and that they've never heard before, all right? And so we say, well, okay, I need you to, 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 to bring it back down to, to the level of the people that you're talking to, because you're not talking to experts in the field here, right? You're talking to lay people, right? And it's interesting that you say, well, they should all know better. Like, no, 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 because Jesus loves the lay people, and he calls the, the experts to serve them. Like that, that what he says to Peter, if you love me, feed my sheep, right? Okay. Um, Martin Luther understood this, and he, he talked about like when he preaches, he's not preaching to his colleagues at Wittenberg. He's preaching to um, Elizabeth and Hans, his kids, who I think uh, were probably like elementary school age at that time. Um, so he says, you know, when we're in church, like we want to preach at a level that, that people can understand and talk about those things. Um, and that's just standard. If, if, I talked, if I asked you about your occupation and what you do, you could tell me about it. And if you talked like you talk to your colleagues at work and people who are in your business or your field, I would probably be lost at some of the things that you would say. And I'd have to ask you, well, what does that mean? Um, when I talked to teachers, when I, when I got on the school board, I'm listening to teachers talk, and they're using terms in shorthand that I've, I have no idea. So I simply had to um, humble myself and say, excuse me, but I'm sorry, what does Title I mean? Oh, well, that's money that we get from the state and we can use for our school. Oh, okay, now I understand, right? I'm, I'm not ignorant anymore. Uh, in fact, the, the Greek word that's used um, here in the text um, Oh, man, where is it? One who is understanding. I think it's an 18. No. Oh, where is that? Um, one who is not able to understand. Maybe it's here in the Greek. Yes, it's in 16. Otherwise, if you bless with the Spirit, the one filling the place of the... How will the uninstructed be able to say amen? And if you look here in Greek... I mean, I know you might not be able to read Greek. See, I'm can, I can talk over your level right here. Look at that. Ooh, yeah. But uh, when you hear it, you'll know what the word, what the word means. Idioto. 
idioto. It's where we get the word idiot from. It simply means someone who doesn't know, who's uninstructed, who's ignorant of the topic at hand. All right? It does not mean mental deficiency. It just means that they're, they're uninstructed. If you start talking to me about how to weld, I don't know anything about that. So I will be an idioto uh, as you talk about it. But then, you know, as you explain it to me, then I'm like, oh, okay, I, I, I kind of understand, right? So um, that was what God is talking about here, all right? That um, we want to build up the church, and you can't do that if you don't understand. And so preachers, particularly new preachers, if they're talking over the, the lay people, they won't ever benefit from it. So Paul, who has all these credentials and has the authority of Scripture, says, I would rather say five words that build up the church than 10,000 with all of the, the fanciness that, that you Corinthians think are so great. And so sometimes I have to tell the, our new preachers, hey, if even Paul says this, let's, let's, uh, this is great, your sermon, I'm, I'm glad that you, you understand, all right, the three genera, right? Okay, I'm glad that you can articulate, right? Um, sanctification in the wide and narrow sense. However, what does this text speak to the people of God today? How does it convict them of their sins and then comfort them with the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ? Because that's what's most important. And sometimes we haul out this verse to kind of instruct them. So anyway, just a, a glimpse into uh, my life as a vicar and supervisor. Um, now that Paul has laid this out and said, these tongues are not building each other up, and so we should stow it in favor of dwelling on the word of God and, and forth telling what God has told us. To that end, verse 20, he says, brothers, do not be children in your thinking. He says, grow up. You are all interested in all this, you know, ecstatic speech, but it's not what you should be. You're, you're better off than this. Be infants in evil, but in your thinking, be mature. He's just saying, saying, grow up, all right? In the law it is written, by people of strange tongues and by the lips of foreigners, I will speak to this people, and even then they will not listen to me, says the Lord. That's from Isaiah chapter 28. It foretells that God would send his prophets, including Isaiah and Jeremiah. They wouldn't listen, and then God would use the Babylonians and the Assyrians and the Persians to try to say the same thing to Israel. Like, you're not doing what you're supposed to, and God is not going to tolerate it, but still they didn't listen. So they were forced to learn these other languages because they weren't listening to God speak to them in their own. And Paul is saying, this is not a good pattern to have in the church. God uses the confusion of language as a, an example of punishment in the Old Testament. So why are you Corinthians holding up this confusion of language as something good? It's not. So let's get away from that and get back to dwelling on prophecy, the Word of God being talked about and, and told about in our midst. Now, he, verse 22 is a little difficult, so we want to take it very slowly. Thus, tongues are a sign, not for believers, but for unbelievers. Okay? Tongues do not benefit the people already in church, is what Paul is saying. Instead, they have been used to reach people who are not yet converted to Christianity, such as happened in Acts. The Corinthians were moving tongues into their church and imagining that that was what was a good thing. But Paul here is saying that was not the purpose for the speaking in tongues. The speaking in tongues was to reach people of other nations, like we saw at Pentecost. Okay? So Paul is saying you Corinthians got it a little bit backwards. Now, the second half of this, prophecy, that is, telling the future, and but primarily, forth telling the word of God, is a sign not for unbelievers, but for those who are in the church already. Because who cares about what God has to say if you don't believe that God exists? This goes to um, 1 Corinthians 1.18 that we already studied. The word of the cross, so the gospel, the message of God, the prophecy of God, the word of God, 
is folly. It is foolishness to those who do not believe, who are perishing. Okay? But to us who are being saved, Christians, people in the church, it is the power of God. So we, if we take 1 Corinthians 1.18 and we bring it here into uh, verse 22, and we say that the, the prophecy is a sign for believers, we can understand because only believers care what God has to say. It's not really meant for unbelievers because they think it's foolishness. Uh, so here, I believe Paul is trying to say there's a proper place for these things, and you, you, you Corinthians got it backwards. That's what I think 22 is. But it's a very difficult verse, uh, even, even for me to kind of wrap my head around. Then he continues, if therefore the whole church comes together and all speak in tongues. So imagine everybody in church is speaking a different language. And you come to visit that church. What are you going to think? I'll tell you, I'm out the door. <laughs> I am out the door. I'm like, I'm not participating in this nonsense. And I just, it's, uh, it's like all the musical instruments in an orchestra just playing different pieces. It, it, it's a, it's negative. It's a negative experience. It's a painful experience. Okay. I want to get out of there. So Paul is saying like, this is not good for, for evangelism. You, 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 again, you got it backwards. You think that this is a good thing for the church because it represents the Holy Spirit being present among you. But I'm telling you, it's tearing the church apart and it's preventing your witness to the world around you. So stop doing it or do it in a more orderly way. Yeah, the people that walk into that cacophony are going to say you're all out of your minds and they're going to hightail it out of there. On the other hand, but if all prophesy, now I'm not talking about all, everybody's telling about a future event, uh, all right, you know, uh, uh, beef shoulder is going to be on sale at the grocery store for $2.29 a pound uh, next Friday at 2 p.m. <laughs> like, if you're all given these sorts of prophecies, like, be nuts. You'd come to the, the same thing. That's not what we're talking about with prophecy. Again, we're talking about the fourth telling of the Word of God. If everybody in the church is talking about what Jesus has done, about um, what Jesus did when he came to the woman at the well, um, how Jesus called the twelve, if, we, if we're talking about the things of God and we're, we're all centered and we're all studying and we're all speaking to one another about what the Bible says— Imagine if we're all centered on the Word of God and somebody enters into that environment where everybody they encounter is talking about what God has said in His Holy Word. Paul says if that's what's going on, he will be convicted by all, he is called by account to all, the secrets of his heart will be disclosed, and falling on his face, he will worship God and declare that God is really among you. So Paul here acknowledges that the Word of God convicts the heart um, because it brings a knowledge of sin, but very quickly it also provides the, the salvation of the Savior, right? Um, so God's Word is that two-edged sword that convicts of sin but also tells of Jesus who dealt with sin. So if we're all talking about that and someone comes into our midst that doesn't know anything about that, they will learn about sin and then they learn about Jesus and having heard that gospel message, their heart will be converted and they will fall down and worship with you and declare that God is really with you. So Paul here says, speaking in tongues is going to drive people away, but dwelling on the word of God and proclaiming the word of God is going to draw people in. Okay? Okay. Um, it's going to say that you're out of your minds, unbelievers, believers, he has all of that. Um, so here we start to get into this idea of worship needs to be orderly, not only for the people who are there every week, but also for the people who visit. Okay, there's a reason for that. And, and I'm going to argue that this is why we need to have a standardized liturgy. It's why we, I, I do not participate in creative worship where the service is different every week. There needs to be some standardization because that is how we learn. If I told you, 
okay? I want you to go through this file system and dig out um, these names that are filed by last name, and I give you a Q and a U and an H and a J, right? While you're flipping through those files, at least some of you, at least some of you are going A, B, C, D, E, F, G, right? You're singing this, the thing that you learned in, in preschool because that is how we learn the best. Repetition, especially along with music, which is why the liturgy of the church shouldn't really change all that much. It's why when you come there, you should be able to memorize. Oh, Lord, open my lips, right? Matins, right? You already know the response if you are acquainted with matins, right? Even if you don't have the, the music, the Lord be with you and with thy spirit, right? You know the responses, okay? So having something that is, that is repeated to music is one of the best ways to learn, and that brings an order to worship, and that helps people learn, and that helps people have order. Classrooms that are out of control are not conducive to learning. Churches, which are not under control, are not conducive to learning. And structure and quiet and respect of only having one person speak at a time are tried and true ways to build that up, which is the major thing that we're concerned about here is the building up of the church. So let's look at this part about orderly worship. What then, brothers, when you come together, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Okay, so he's saying that there is a standard operating procedure in how you do this worship. But he also says, let all things be done for, again, building up. Right? So here at Redeemer, when we come together, we start with a hymn, and then we have confession and absolution. We use all four of the divine services out of Lutheran service book simply because we're a teaching congregation for our vicars. We want them to be exposed to all four uh, variations so that when they are called, no matter what that church may use, they are prepared and familiar with it. Okay? It doesn't help us out as much. We get a lot of visitors here. Just when they start to get the hang of divine service one, then we switch it up. And then we have divine service three and the these and the thous, and they're kind of lost for a little while. But those four variations, and we repeat them throughout the year, quickly become part of the average person's repertoire if they're here on a regular basis. Um, but so we're a little bit different in that respect. We, but we have a purpose for why we use those variations. Most congregations would use one or maybe two uh, different services, and their people would become accustomed to that. But then there's other congregations that are non-liturgical, um, and they don't follow an, an orderly form of worship. It changes every week depending upon what the pastor wants to do and what choir pieces he has and what, what the band is going to play and what drama skits they might have, um, and so it can all be, always be different. Um, so the order of worship doesn't necessarily have to be the ancient order of worship, although I think that's beneficial for the life of the church. That's a different conversation. Um, but it should be orderly. No matter what the style is, it needs to be orderly. Okay? Here we see that they have a hymn, they have a lesson, and then someone comes to say something or to speak in a tongue or to give an interpretation of a tongue. This seems to be the pattern of worship, at least in Corinth. Paul's criteria for all of this is that it be done for building up. If any speak in a tongue, let there only be two or three at most. And in each, do in turn and let someone interpret. So he sets these criteria. Okay? He's bringing order to the chaos. Keep that in mind. But if there is no one to interpret, then don't speak in the tongue. Let each of them keep silent in church. And when they go to pray with them, by themselves or at their home, then, hey, speak to himself and to God. But don't presume to take the floor and address everybody if there's no one to interpret what you're going to say. Because if they can't understand it, they're not going to be built up. He then gives further criteria. Let two or three prophets speak. So let there be two or three preachers. Not foretelling the future, but foretelling the word of God and how it applies to the lives of the people. You imagine your church service if you had two or three preachers in a row. 
you'd be like, what is this? <laughs> but that was the, the pattern of the early church. They would have a hymn and a lesson, and then you'd have a smattering of people that would, would speak to you. Uh, so it was sort of a mostly all-day thing. Let the others weigh what is said. So here we see a criteria for other Christians to sort of judge the accurateness of what is being said because God warned us to be on watch for false prophets. So they're being held accountable to the word of God. This is one reason why Lutherans are in circuits, why we belong to a synod, why we have circuit visitors, and we have synod and district presidents. There's a hierarchy of people, ecclesiastical supervisors, that watch over us. Now, all of us are trained in the same way, and we swear that we will teach and preach in accord with our historical Lutheran confessions so you know what you're getting. But if we start to deviate from that, we have other pastors in our local area that are supposed to come and say, brother, what I heard you preach on Sunday, I don't think is biblical. Let's talk about it and find out why. Okay, that's what's supposed to happen. Um, but if you are belonging to a church, um, Christian cornerstone, non-denominational, a ministry of Robert Early, okay? Well, where is Robert Early trained? Well, you could look up and say, oh, he went to this seminary, he went to this college, okay. But he got the church from his dad, who split off from a Baptist church up north and created his own little thing and doesn't doesn't adhere to any sort of denomination anymore. So there, who's checking on Pastor Early's message? Nobody. He can say what he wants. This is how you get cults, by the way. It's what happened with Jim Jones. It's what happened with David Koresh, right? That they, uh, Jim Jones actually started off as a Pentecostal. I don't know. He was here in Indiana and then went out to San Francisco and then went off the rails from there. Um, but there's nobody checking in and, and, and supervising this message. Here in the Bible, we see that other preachers, other pastors are supposed to um, kind of keep preachers on task. And if they're not preaching the word of God, they are to be confronted and corrected. If they, they continue to do it, then they are to be ignored, like a tax collector or a sinner. Um, let the others weigh what is said. If a revelation is made to another sitting there, let the first be silent. This is interesting. So if you have somebody that is, is there and is talking about something, and one of the other teachers claims to have received a revelation or a new uh, letter, uh, maybe from one of the apostles or something, and they say, oh, well, I, I God talked to me and told me this, Paul says, make way for that new message. Now, this is before Revelation was written. So, again, the gift of foretelling future events and God using prophets in that time to speak to his people was still going on. We are told in the Bible, again, that these things will cease, and I do believe that they have ceased because we have the full record from Genesis to Revelation. But in Paul's time, that wasn't there. And Paul is saying that if you receive a new revelation, make way for it. Let the first guy who holds the floor yield to this new thing. Now, do you think that that could be abused? If you were somebody who liked to have the spotlight and, and you know, teacher Joseph is up there and he's talking and you're like, oh man, I, I wish I was up there. I go, ah, oh, 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 I've received a new revelation from God. Joseph, remember Paul's, Paul's rules? You have to make way. So I get the floor. Of course that could be abused. And it probably was. Is that right? No. Did God judge that? I'm sure he did. But in general, Paul gives rules for if everybody's operating um, on their best behavior, let's put it that way, if they're all concerned about building up the church, if everything was good. He certainly knows that it will be abused, but that doesn't change how he thinks things should operate. Okay. Um, make way uh, for him and, and let him speak. Only one at a time. That's an important thing. You can all prophesy one by one that all may learn and be encouraged. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to prophets. Again, pastors evaluate pastors. Uh, Christians evaluate Christians according to the word of God. God is not a God of confusion, but of peace and of order. 
Again, that is the whole purpose. He's bringing order to chaos. Keep that in mind as we now move into this section. As in the churches of the saints, in all the churches of the saints, so that's not just here in Corinth, Paul is going to be talking about a practice that was elsewhere. The women should keep silent in the churches. There it is. This does not mean that when women enter a church, they can't say hello to other people. They can't say, God be with you, or they can't sing, or they can't, you know, talk about anything. That is ridiculousness. This verse is in the context of orderly worship, of people leading orderly worship. Let there only be one or two at a time. Let it be done for building up, right? Notice here that in this section, he calls them brothers. He's speaking to men. So here, even though we know that some women were given the gift of, prof of prophesying, of being edifying, and doing these things or foretelling the word of God, Paul says, as in all the churches, they are not to do so in a leadership capacity. This is a subject much bigger than this. And if you go into the, all of Scripture, you will see that God has set his church leaders limited to men and not just any man. There are many men who are excluded from the public ministry because they are not apt to teach. They are given to drunkenness. They are given to wrath. All sorts of different things. So God limits the priesthood to a very small section of men. Why? Is it because women can't do the job? No. They are fully capable of doing the tasks that men do, but they're not allowed. They are not meant to. They have their own role. They have their own beautiful vocation. And it might be different than the vocation of public worship leader, but remember our point different does not mean inequality, okay? People will say that, oh, well, the reason why Paul said that, that women are to keep silent is because it's the patriarchy, it's the patriarchal culture of the ancient world that we've now carried in. We know better than that. Well, first of all, God doesn't change. It's not like he made a mistake back then or that he gave a rip about what was going on in the culture at the time. And so he just allowed Paul to, to move on and say, well, yeah, we don't like, we don't like women you know, having authority over men, so just say this and I'll update it later. Nonsense. God says this for a reason. Also, historically speaking, most religions at that time were filled with women priests, priestesses, almost all of them. The male-only priesthood of the Jews and later the Christian church was unique. It would set them apart from the religions around them. Why does God do that? Well, one, I'm not entirely sure of why he does it. And I say entirely sure, because I do have a lot of reasons from Scripture that I believe lend us to understand that. But there's probably things that only God knows that, that I don't. But the number one for me, the one that changed my position on this, just so you know, I once was of the opinion that my church will finally get with the, at that time, 20th century and have women pastors. And then I actually read the Bible and I started to understand things. Um, but the one that, that sticks out to me is Jesus is male. He is biologically male. And pastors stand in his place and deliver his gifts as if he himself were there. So it makes sense to me that his representatives would be male. Jesus is biologically male. This I'm gonna get I'm gonna geek out here for a minute with human biology. All right. So you got Mary, right? Joseph is not involved, right? A male has an X and a Y chromosome. That's what so Jesus has a body, even today, that has an X and Y chromosome in it. Okay, that's what makes him male, right? Mary, however, only has X chromosomes. So where did the Y come from? best answer I can give you is it came from God, from the Holy Spirit, who through the combination of X and Y chromosomes in the womb of Mary, that single cell that then divides out into this body of Jesus, right? Even in his genetic code, you have 
the coming together of the fully human and the fully God in an X and a Y chromosome coming together to make a full Christ, a Jesus, who is biologically male and will always be biologically male. So if I understand that, then I understand why he requests and commands a male-only priesthood that those who give out his gifts would be that way. The Bible also talks about us being the body of Christ, okay? Um, it talks about the family being a pattern for the church, which is why the tradition of calling pastors father, their spiritual father, all right? But there also the Bible speaks about Christ as the groom and the church as the bride, okay? Um, so you can't say that the feminine is diminished when he talks about the, the church being his bride. And that's why you talk about the church being her. Uh, you, you'll see that sometimes. The church and her pastors or something along those lines, okay? Because we, we understand that there is marriage. The, the marriage of Christ and, and the church uh, is a theme that runs throughout the Bible. It's especially uh, evident in the book of Revelation. So all that considered, male and female are important. They are different that does not make them unequal, okay? So women are not to be leaders in the church. That doesn't mean they can't lead women's Bible studies or teach children, but it means that they shouldn't be up in front proclaiming the word of God on Sunday morning. This is just one place that the New Testament addresses this issue, but it is addressed and it is a biblical one. One that I didn't always agree with, but then I read the scriptures, and I had to come to the conclusion that either God was wrong and he needed me to correct him, or maybe my thinking was wrong. And um, even though it doesn't fit with my view of the world and, and equality and all those sorts of things that I thought I knew, maybe God was right. So let that sit where it may. All right? Um, Women should keep silent in the churches. Again, this is only about the public proclamation of the word, the job and the role of pastor or priest. They are not permitted to speak as pastor or priest, but they should be in submission as the law says. Okay? There's order. If there is anything they desire to learn, let them ask their husbands at home. Husbands are meant to be pastors in the home. They should be educated, and they should care for their wife and children as Christ cares for his bride, the church, with a sacrificial love that they will never add up to, but that is what they are called to do. Um, submitting to a husband is no more demeaning than a husband submitting to Christ and Christ submitting to the glory of God the Father, right? It does not diminish us in the least. It's simply about order, okay? Just because I prefer to eat all the colors of M&Ms and leave the green for last does not mean that they taste any different or that they have different value, right? Um, green is my favorite color, so that's just why I do that. But they're, they're the same. and the, the, the order in which I consume them doesn't change their value, doesn't change their essence, okay? Different does not mean unequal, all right? It is shameful for a woman to speak in church, right? So again, when we understand this in the context of orderly public worship, the job of foretelling and forthtelling the word of God in a public way, we're talking about the role of pastor or priest, Paul right here says blatantly, it is shameful for a woman to speak in church in that way especially with her head uncovered as we had back in chapter 11, was it? So these things kind of go together. But all this was happening in Corinth. There is no indication that this, this recommendation, this requirement, this command from Paul inspired by the Holy Spirit has come to an end. Again, it's not like the, the law about dietary things, which God himself got rid of when he talked to Peter. Okay, There's no indication that this prohibition against women leading public worship has ever come to an end, which is why my church and faithful biblical churches out there still hold to a male-only priesthood, and also Jesus is biologically male. And so those who represent and stand in his stead for us, it makes sense that Christ would want them to be male. 
which is also why they exclude eunuchs from priesthood in the Old Testament, just for your information. Uh, 36. Moving on. <laughs> Or was Paul is going to ask some just rhetorical questions. Or was it from you that the word of God came? Are you the one who made up the word of God? Did you write it? Obviously not. Or are you the only ones that it has reached? Do you know better than everybody else that doesn't have these issues? Of course not. If anyone thinks that he is a prophet or he's spiritual, he should acknowledge the things that I'm writing to you that are a command of the Lord. Again, Paul is going to lay out his, his, his authority here, right? If anyone thinks that, oh, he's spiritual and he knows what God wants and he knows God's, well, then he should acknowledge that I met Jesus on the road and Jesus told me to write these things to you. So he's setting up a conundrum for these people that are going to go against his word. They say, oh, well, yes, I believe God wholeheartedly. and That's why I speak in tongues. Well, but the same God who called this guy to tell you things is telling you not to speak in tongues. So which is it? Right? Paul's setting up a conundrum. And that's why it's a rhetorical question that's moving the, the, the argument forward in his favor. If anyone does not recognize this, he is not recognized. If you don't think that I actually met Jesus, and you don't think that I have the ability to speak in his stead authoritatively in the church, you're not going to get much traction. Paul is laying out his authority. He can be fact-checked, and he can be verified, he can be vetted, he knows that he has these authorities. He met with the entire church, the, the, the disciples in Jerusalem, right? So it's not like he's just claiming this idly. No, he, he knows. So, my brothers, earnestly desire to prophesy. Earnestly desire to be about the word of God and do not forbid speaking in tongues because he does admit that it is a spiritual gift. He's just not very high on it. And the, the guys in Corinth should stop doing it if they're not doing it in a certain way. It's not building up the church. He's not saying that it doesn't have value. He's not saying that it isn't true. He's simply saying, you know what? It's not as beneficial as proclaiming the word of God. Also, he probably knows that it's coming to an end, whereas the word of the Lord will endure forever. The word will continue forever, but the prophecies and the speaking in tongues and the faith healings, they're going to come to an end. Paul knows that. And so he says, focus on that which endures. And that is the fourth telling of God's word. In all things, they should be done decently and in order. Okay? Orderly worship. We want to have orderly worship. It's important. Okay? We are the body of Christ. We are members one of another, right? Um, we do not all have the same function. Some are pastors. Some are teachers. Some are helpers. Some are builders. Some are singers. Some are accountants. Some are janitors. We all have the same function. That does not mean that we are unequal. It means that we have different roles. And those roles are beautiful, each in their own way. And we make up one body of Christ. That's our study for today. A little bit longer. Um, there's a lot of stuff in Corinthians. There really is. And it affects our church life today because it affected church life back then, even though we're not dealing with the same issues that they are in the same way that they are. Um, but remember, this, uh, the, the litmus test for anything in church should be, is it building one another up? I'm not supposed to seek my own aggrandizement. I'm supposed to consider what helps my neighbor. What helps my neighbor, primarily for the church at whole, is calm, orderly worship that doesn't change every week to week. There's a set order of worship that we're not just having a cacophony of people speaking in other languages. It has to be intelligible to people. And um, it should always be done driven by love for our neighbor in understanding that Jesus died for them. And so that is the primary purpose of church, is getting people to understand, to believe and to know that God loves them, that Jesus came for them, that he died on the cross for them, and that he rose to life again, and that by believing in him, they have life in his name. That is the primary purpose of the church. Everything must be to serve that primary purpose. And one of the first and foremost things is calm, orderly worship. And Paul sets these guidelines for the church in Corinth, which also come down to the church wherever you are. Thank you for studying along with me. God bless you. I hope to see you next week for probably our last installment because I am planning to take a break for Advent. 
our church will stream Advent services on Wednesdays. So between the services that I have and just the increased workload, this is going to take a little bit of a back seat for the month of December. So you have an opportunity to catch up or maybe do some other side work or maybe go back and watch your favorite one. I don't know, but um, I'm going to take a break for Advent so that I can also focus on the coming of the Lord Jesus once again. Thank you for understanding. Thank you for studying along with us. Like and subscribe if you haven't already, and I will see you next week for chapter 15. Thank you. <laughs>